Justin is sick, but I'm here. We're going to talk about the winter meetings, the rumors, what's flying out, what is getting discussed, all on today's Locked On Guardians. You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Lockdown Guardians. I'm kicking it old school here. Uh, this is the old entrance video. It is the old entrance video as I count for how we do this. But uh, it's I'm using OBS. I'm kind of using what I used to do when I did all the solo shows. So again, Justin is sick right now, so send him your well wishes over on Twitter at JL underscore baseball. But we didn't want to not have a show. For those who don't know me, I am Jeff Ellis. I know people hate the reading of resumes. It's literally what they tell us to do. Uh, I used to be a draft writer at Scouting 24-7, and if you want to go see some truly terrible, I was never good at video, uh, videos of Sean Murphy in college, I tweeted out some that I had. I found the mother load. I found my entire uh, former archive of articles and videos, so I will be slowly but surely sharing some of the videos that make sense, so you can go check out Twitter for that. I'm going to share them from my personal tw- uh, YouTube. It's not something I use a ton of, but occasionally I throw some things up there, and you know they're my videos, so I figured I'd them there uh i want to thank everyone who subscribed we're up to 1020 to keep that count going and today's show i wanted to talk a little bit about how free agency is affecting cleveland how it is kind of helping them yes and no let's talk a little bit about some of the rumors of the day and let's talk about the all mlb team Uh, i'm going to save that for the next segment because i might go a little off the rails with how annoying the all mlb team is but first uh, Mark Feinstein, Fine Sand, Fine Sand, that's his name. Again, with the most ridiculous tweet of the day. The Astros have emerged as a potential suitor for Sean Murphy per source. Uh, you know, they have been connected to Wilson Contreras, but apparently Contreras doesn't want to go there because they want to play Martin Maldonado and it's a part time gig. Uh, so, again, teams who are looking at a part time gig at catcher are still looking at Murphy. Uh, this is just complete told on our bunk. I don't know why Fine Sand is being a mouthpiece right now, but he is clearly being one. Why? Because the Astros have maybe the worst system in baseball. They don't have a lot to trade from. What, Hunter Brown and Drew Gilbert? Depending on your view on Gilbert, some people are not high. Listen, I love Drew Gilbert. I had him 11th in last year's draft, but he is not a centerpiece. It has to be Hunter Brown. Uh, and they can't afford to trade pitching after Verlander walked today, so none of it makes any sense. Uh, it's the silliest thing of the day, and I just wanted to say, again, you know, just spend some time and think. Like that, that was I, the silliest thing I saw all day. It's like it makes no gold darn sense. Why they don't have the pieces? They don't have the pieces at all to make a deal like that happen uh, without trading off their major league roster, and they're not trading Pena because how do they replace him? Like, I we'll see the Astros if they you know, uh, do something uh, in free agency, but now having, I mean, I know they, they did Abreu, all right, but losing Verlander while adding in Abreu um, and also paying Rafael Montero is not exactly a huge upgrade. Uh, and Christian Vasquez is rumored to not want to return to Houston because he wants to be an everyday starter. So again, I, I think they're in a hard situation. I think they're going to have to run with Martin Maldonado and then, I don't know, if you try Diaz, if you try Corey Lee. I mean, Corey Lee is a first-round draft pick who had some interesting data for a while uh, but has not played well when given opportunities. He was a player I felt like they drafted to inflate his value, and then they didn't sell him in time. And 2021 and 2022 were pretty atrocious for him. But as that guy who was drafted and had a rather amazing year in 2019, he was like a third-round value they took in the first round, and... You know, I thought they would try to sell high because they did that with like, uh, was it Corbin Martin? Was that the, 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 you know, Seth Beer? They did this. They took college performers, let them marinate in a ball where they would excel and then use them as trade assets. Go look at that Granky deal. It's all guys like that. Uh, unfortunately, I missed the boat here. I don't know what they do, but I mean, they could end up with Maldonado and Hedges. I, I don't see any way they can trade for a top line catcher. I just don't see a way, but they kind of have to if they want to do some kind of platoon situation 
because they just don't have the pieces to make it work otherwise. So again, look at your sources, look at who you're trusting and understand right now, for whatever reason, some people are just being complete mouthpieces. Uh, listen, teams know that John Murphy's in high demand, but it just, it's, I don't understand any of the rationale for this. Um, it's not like it's going to change the offers out there. Anyone with half a brain looks at Houston and goes, they can't, they can't approach what uh, Tampa or Cleveland or St. Louis could do. So, yeah, it was that is the silly take of the day. Uh, I also wanted to comment, you know, Trey Turner, Trey Turner signed with um, Philadelphia for 11 years, $300 million. Oh, man, I went back, and it's like he and Carlos Rondon, I thought, would go 1-2 in their draft class. I didn't actually go and look at what my final big board was in 2014, though I could now that I found my old drive of articles. But... What's interesting in terms of that is the fact that, A, he supposedly wanted to stay on the East Coast. He was, him and Rondona, as I said, both went to NC State. And oh, 2015 is the earliest I had something. So that must have been my last year at IBI where I, oh, I actually don't have all my 2015 stuff. But still, uh, when I was going through the data, before I distracted myself here, uh, it's crazy to me that he fell to the 13th overall pick of those top 12 selections. Three of them didn't make it to the big leagues. And those three, uh, three of those four were high school arms, the risk of the high school arm. And I mean, outside of like Aaron Nola with Philly, I mean, you can make a case that he was the next best guy in that group. Uh, and then on top of it, remember that San Diego flipped him uh, at, at you know, he was traded immediately. Like they changed the rules because he was a player to be named later who got the minute he was available to be traded was traded to the Washington nationals after being a first round pick, uh, because you know, they were trying to go all in on, uh, it was that weird 2015 when Preller got there before their big rebuild where he just went crazy and tried to acquire each and every, uh, player to immediately start winning. And then they were terrible. Uh, so San Diego, in that deal, sent Jake Bowers, by the way, and Birch Smith, I think a two-time Guardians draft pick to Tampa. Uh, the Tampa Bay Race sent Jose Castilla, Ryan Hannigan, Will Myers, and Gerardo Reyes to the Padres. The Nationals sent Travis Ott and Steven Sousa Jr. to Tampa. And then the Nationals also got Trey Turner in that deal. So long, long story short of this, uh, Tampa blew it because they wanted Steven Sousa. And San Diego blew it because they traded... Trey Turner for Will Myers. Uh, this is just a bad deal all around for everyone who wasn't the Nationals. I don't know if there's any feeling of, like, animosity, uh, but it was interesting, I thought, that it was reported today that San Diego offered him more money and that he didn't take it. So I just wanted to point that out. And then why does this help Cleveland? So uh, Philadelphia actually drafts after Cleveland in the second round, so it doesn't affect that draft pick, but... What it does do is it means the comp- uh, they're going to lose their second and their fifth. So in the grand scheme of things, that is now Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and why am I blanking on the uh, Texas, who have lost their second rounders by signing uh, players. They've also lost their fifth rounders. So for Cleveland, that means that their second rounder has moved up two spots. That comp B pick has moved from 69 to 66, and their, f- uh, their fifth rounders moved up two spots. So all of that means I sat down there and crunched the math from last year. That's an extra one hundred and seventy-four thousand three hundred dollars to spend uh, of pool money based on last year's number, and one hundred eighty-three thousand they can spend. I know what you're thinking. That's not a lot of money, but that is money they always spend. It's money you can guarantee that they will spend. And one hundred seventy-four thousand, like uh, good old ninety-nine, didn't get that much out of college. Like that is a significant amount of money, and that's on top of, you know the what they could do. Like if they just held on to that money on day three, you can sit back and get, you know, 275,000 spent on a player and get a really good player. That is not insignificant. So I think that's worth pointing out that as these players sign, it's going to keep increasing uh, as long as it's not. Well, so like if they sign another player, I believe like Philadelphia, for instance, they said they're not going to, but if they did, then they lose their third and their fourth. So it just keeps taking away pick and money from them. Uh, more what we want are all of these guys, like Aaron Judge, to go to San Francisco. We want uh, Detroit to decide that they want to sign a shortstop. We want everyone to go the wrong places and Cleveland's draft pick to go from 23rd in the second round up to, like, 13. And we want uh, you know that comp pick to then all of a sudden be 
at the end of the second round. Like that's that's where we kind of want it to be. It's just an interesting thing to look at. It's a way to positively reframe uh, what has occurred so far. But there is a benefit, even if it hurts, that the teams you're hoping to compete against are getting better. We're going to take our first break at this point in the show. We're going to talk about a quick sponsor, come back and talk about these all MLB teams, which are trash. And our sponsor, as you can tell if you're watching on YouTube with the beautiful little header, is our good friends over at Bet Online. Your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis is Bet Online. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from football to basketball to soccer and esports. They've got it all at Bet Online. And if you love sports podcasts, which you obviously do if you're listening to this show, you can find those at Bet Online as well. We're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. Head to, your, head to the website today. Or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online, where the game starts. And if we have some fun and go to bet online, right now they're only futures. They had a bunch early on, but it's not shifted. It's just who will sign Aaron Judge? Giants negative one fifty, Yankees plus one ten. It certainly seems like it is going the way of the Giants, uh, which again helps Cleveland with the draft pick, as we talked about in the last segment. Uh, and it hurts the Yankees and takes Judge out of the American League. So I am rooting for the Giants. Uh, in terms of MLB futures, the World Series odds are up there. Uh, it still goes Dodgers, Astros, Braves, Mets, Yankees. Uh, the gap has gotten a little bit bigger between the Dodgers and the Astros after the Astros losing Verlander. Uh, I, we will see, I'm sure, some, some shifting. The Mets are down to plus 900. But right now the Yankees are plus 1,000. That could massively take a hit. So go check out Bet Online today for all of your sports betting information. And let's talk about these MLB, all MLB teams. <laughs> I'm not going to roll my eyes anymore. Uh, here's the thing. This is the fourth year they've done it, and it's a 50% vote came from fans and 50% from a panel of experts, and that's why it's like Houston Astros all over the place. First team, uh, let's, again, like I'm going to get myself in trouble with Mark Feinsand, but, like, he, he included... Uh, Alex Manea, first team pitchers. Manea was, if I drop the uh, to 120 for um, or 100 for minimum qualified innings, uh, Manea was 18th in the league in WAR. Yeah, he had a 2.24 uh, ERA, but his FIP was was about a run higher. He was tied with Zach Wheeler. You know, he's he he's not first team. Like that is just someone looking at WAR at ERA and just being like ERA and like walking away. Uh, you know, Verlander deserves to be on the first team. I think Otani deserves to be on the out team, first team. Alcantara, Framber should be second team. Honestly, for me, as I go through this, I haven't even touched on the Guardians half of it, but I'm just going to sit here and rant. It's like when you are looking at who were the most valuable guys this year, Nola and Rondon are the other two guys who should be on the first team with Verlander and Alcantara and Otani. Like, that's your first team. Those are the top five. The next group on this listing had Julio Arias, uh, Dylan Cease, Max Fried, Aaron Nola, Max Scherzer. And again, I'm just going to point out that like Shane Bieber should be on second team. Uh, Freed should be there as well. Framber should be second team as well. You know, Max Scherzer, it was only 145 innings. It was a very limited sample size. So, I mean, he was great. I, I get that. Cease is kind of borderline um, for that as well. You know, Kevin Gaussman probably should have... He should have been on there before Manoa. Uh, Corbin Burns should have gotten more love. I just didn't did not like this listing. And it, again, like the Astros, there's too many Astros. Like, there's just too many... I mean, the first team had one, two, three, four Astros. And then you still had Kyle Tucker on the second and a reliever. They ended up with six players. Yeah. So... Cleveland did have two guys make it. And it's the first time they've ever had anyone make the all MLE team in the fourth year. Emmanuel Classe made first team, and I, hey, I give him credit there. Uh, I didn't expect to see him up there. I, you know, I, I saw Fine, Sign, Fine Sand uh, put him second team, but I expect him to be one of the top four relievers. He's up there. And then, uh, again, to just really go after this guy today, he had Andres Jimenez first team. Jimenez ended up second team. Was the first two Guardians to ever make it? So you know, second team with Lindor being the second team shortstop, which is kind of funny. You've got those two guys there, and then Class A uh, on the first team. It's the first time they've had anyone make the All MLB team. 
they both made it this year. Um, Class A, you know, the official press release, the fifth highest single season total in Cleveland history. He posted the second lowest ERA in the AL this year and now owns consecutive sub-140 ERA seasons. 1.4, I should say, ERA seasons. I mean, that's in one of just four relievers in MLB history to do that. And, uh, you know, Kimbrell would have been a good guess. Joe Nathan, like at peak. Wade Davis, not who I expected to be up there. He converted 91% of his chances, including 25 consecutive from May 14th to September 5th. Led the Major League Baseball, the Major League Baseball, led the Major Leagues and relief appearances of 77. And then allowed one hit in his six shutout innings uh, in four outings in the postseason. Um I'm sorry, he is just the second Cleveland player named All-MLB All MLB. Whew, first team. So Shane Bieber had made it. I guess the first article I read was incorrect. So he made it, uh, Bieber previously. Class A is the first first-teamer. And then Jimenez posted the third highest baseball reference war in the American League behind Judge and Otani. Sixth highest in baseball. Uh, I don't necessarily love baseball reference war, but still, that's pretty impressive. Finished ninth in OPS. 10th in batting average, finished 5th in the league in defensive war, won a gold glove, led second baseman with defensive run save. He posted the highest war by any MLB second baseman in their age 23 or younger season since Eddie Collins in 1910, and the third highest overall in the modern era, uh, the only other one being Collins in 1909. So that's, again, a ridiculous year he had. The only batter to post a higher war in their age 23 uh, or younger year in Cleveland's history was Shoeless Joe Jackson. And he became the youngest Cleveland to start an all-star game since Bob Beller in 1941. That's pretty amazing, right? Let's, let's just be 100% honest. I don't think when you hear all the numbers like that, it, it's, it's ridiculous the year that those two had. They're both deserving of this. And again, I think Shane Bieber should have been up there. And if you're mad about Jose, it's just hard. Like, Machado had a great year. Arenado. Arenado? Arenat. Nolan had a great year um, amongst third basemen, if I were to to break this down. I think, you know, Jose was not the dude this year. That thumb injury affected him, and he was still awesome. But, uh, you know, Machado had a 7.4 war. Arenado had a 7.3 war. Jose Ramirez at 6.2, and then Austin Riley at 5.5, who came back to earth pretty significantly, but was still awesome. He just wasn't quite what he was a year ago. I mean, a 5.5 is awesome. I'm not going to sit here. And almost 40 home runs. Austin Riley was a beast, um, an absolute beast. It's tough. Third base, I mean, Bregman had a 5.5. Rafael Devers, who we've talked about, you know, in the years he's had, he had a a 4.9. Chapman was 7th. Suarez was 8th. Yandy Diaz, ninth. Then Ryan McMahon with a nice rebound for Colorado at 10th on that list. It's it's going to be interesting. 17th on that list, by the way, Gio Urshela. I know Cleveland never had a chance at him because it was the Twins trading him, but how nice would he have looked? I had someone ask me about that um, recently in our comments, and I'm like, oh, I will bring that up. It seems like a perfect time. Urshela being a right-handed bat whose defense was up and down last year but could play multiple positions, like he would have been – that caddy we want for Naylor, like Urshila would have been it. Like he would have been the perfect caddy. Uh, and he went so cheaply because uh, Minnesota wanted to save money. Uh, you probably want to, and that's the thing, like caddy slash DH. Like Urshila would have been, I know it's weird for some, but occasionally he could play third base, let Jose rest more. Like he really would have been an ideal target. Unfortunately, uh, Minnesota was never going to trade him to Cleveland, but. His offensive production was really solid last year. The defense has been declining, but if he's like a backup slash platoon, I mean, the, the runs created plus was good enough for him to play every day, uh, but he would have been a really good target. So I agree. Um, I wish I could remember who was in the comments who said that. And yeah, if he wasn't coming from the Twins, let's be honest, uh, that made it an impossibility. But if he was from some other organization, he should have been uh, 100% a target for the Guardians. I think he could have been a darn near everyday player in a DH utility, super utility role, and definitely someone out there against lefties. We're going to take our last break. We're going to come back and you know, talk about a few other pieces of breaking news, what occurred today outside of the Turner situation on today's Locked On Guardians. Okay, we're back. So we already mentioned the Trey Turner deal. We should mention that Justin Verlander um, 
signed with the uh, New York Mets, which is something I called on Friday, right, after everything else happened. Uh, I believe he could not get the qualifying offer because he had previously accepted the qualifying offer from the Astros. Um, so with him, you know, he, he was offered it last year. So he signed a one-year deal, and he turned it down last year, didn't accept it, and so they couldn't uh, – Arizona gets nothing. You get nothing, right? Uh, that is the case. So Arizona loses Verlander and has nothing to show for it. Will they move that money around? I don't know if they necessarily have to dive into the starting pitching market. Like, on top of what I, you know, while I was like, you know, Framber is not first team, he was definitely a second team pitcher. Uh, Christian Javier is great. They have a solid top four. Uh, Hunter Brown, if they don't make a trade, is a solid fifth. Like, they are not in that position where they their need to go out and do is honestly realize that Martin Maldonado is more of a backup and go sign a real catcher. But, yeah, they're they're in an okay position. Obviously, they are weaker. Hunter Brown from Justin Verlander is a hit. Even if Hunter Brown ends up being better than Verlander next year, which is unlikely, uh, you're still losing what Verlander gave you in 2021. Like you're not replacing the 2021 version of him, and there's always the risk that he isn't going to be that version at the age of 40. But with him signing, uh, we have definitely kind of see the top outside of Rondon of the pitching market go. I'm curious who will be in on Rondon. Uh, after him, it's it's a lot more shaky. Um, the pitcher from Japan, whose name I'm blanking on, uh, is probably the next most talked about guy. Uh, it, it's definitely not like last year. You had like three or four big names out there. I mean, more than three or four big names. It felt like there was a lot of kind of higher-end pitching. And it's like Chris Bassett is uh, once four years, which is a heck of a commitment to him. So it's going to be interesting to watch. And again, root for high pitching contracts because it just makes – Police X trade value all the better, or Savale's trade value. Whoever they decide is the guy that they might consider moving on from. I know everyone's impatient right now, but here's the truth of the matter. I don't think any trade for Murphy is happening in the next 24 hours. Now, now that I'm saying that, watch a trade break in the next five minutes. But why do I think a trade is unlikely to happen for any player? Like, why do I think Cleveland isn't likely to go out and, and trade for Brian Reynolds? Why they're unlikely to go out and trade for, you know, Nick Fortes, who's like my favorite under uh, under the radar sleeper candidate at catcher. Why? Because the Rule Five is just a few days away. And if you are a team that likes an Andrew Mizziasic, we've talked about him on the show having some really good uh, data. Like he is a data darling. If you want him as your fourth piece, the only way you can be assured of that is the Rule Five draft is over. And by the way. Post Rule 5, someone like him has extra value because you get to have him on your roster. You can invite him to camp, and you don't have to, he doesn't have to be added. Like, you can add him at some point during the season when things start to shake out and you have a little bit of better understanding of your roster, but it gives you more flexibility on that prospect as opposed to if you acquired him, you know, a la Jose Fermin with the Cardinals and immediately add him to your 40 man. There is more flexibility. It's like the Guardians with David Fry a year ago. He was a player to be named later because they wanted that flexibility they wanted some catching depth and a fourth piece in any big deal is likely to be someone like that and on top of that if you're a team like Oakland who's sitting there with 39 out of 40 spots open on your 40 man going and trading and getting like we've talked about on the show someone like Valera and Rocchio that's that fills up your roster right there uh you it also takes away your ability to draft anyone uh unless you let someone else go. So if you wait till after the Rule 5 draft, you can see how things play out, see if someone you really like that you left a spot open for potentially uh, is there and worth drafting, and then you can kind of sort through the rest later on. It just gives teams more flexibility. So why wouldn't you wait another 48 if you're Oakland? It's not like those deals are going away, and that's kind of where we are. It's a little bit of a holding pattern. Free agents will sign. Like, free agents will sign, and that will affect things. But... Uh, I think trades are a little more held up because why not wait? You know, what's what's the big holdup? Uh, unless you're someone sitting out there. Like, this isn't to say that a trade won't happen, but I think part of the reason it kind of slows up and why everyone's like, oh, what's going to happen? Uh, I think we'll see more free agents. Like, we saw two free agents today. I think we'll see more of that free agent. I, th- I assume before the end of the winter meetings, Judge will sign with San Francisco. That's, that's my gut. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I think... My prediction is Xander Bogarts ends up uh, in L.A. and Correa with the Cubs, and I don't know where Swanson goes. But 
yeah, that, that's kind of my general view right now. Um, twins on Rondon. Let's do that. I think they're going to use some of their money on pitching, so they'll go that way with it. But yeah, I think I think it's a little bit of a holding pattern just because of the Rule 5. And then once it's done, you know, a trade can be announced and it's easy. And, you know, if you like those certain guys who might have been at risk, now you no longer have to worry about them. There is no risk. They are safe. You don't have to sit back and worry about them. You can just have Mizzy Ozick as a guy you're interested in as your fourth piece. Like, he is a very classic raise type. A very, not raise, uh, athletics type. A raise type as well, let's be honest. But, yeah, he is a one of those performance guys that is going to intrigue people. I am, you know, like I said, I'm just, I'm wait and see. I, I think they're going to do something. And I know if you're listening, you heard me all last offseason be like, Jeff, you thought they were going to do something last year. They did. They, they added Brian Shaw. Oh, that doesn't count. No, I agree with you. Uh, you know, and Yale ended up being a great addition, though. Better than almost uh, every other free agent reliever. Uh, I think that they have the motivation to get something done. I think they have been too far down this Murphy track that if it goes sideways, they're not going to have another plan in place. Uh, I think, you know, they, they thought that they had Matt Olson. They thought they were very close on Olson. And then the Braves came in when they realized Freeman was leaving, that that wasn't going to work out. And they just came in a house of fire. And then Cleveland didn't get that Olson deal. They've been in on players. They thought they had uh, Murphy at the trade deadline. So it's now going back it certainly feels right now like this is how I know people are so tired of Sean Murphy talk or you're not tired of Sean Murphy talk. It's either one way or the other. You've turned it off because you're done or you're excited for more talk. But it's basically like this. Uh, we want one of your big three. Cleveland? No. Well, Houston likes it. Didn't you see that report? We're not trading a big three. Are you sure Espinino? Espinino? He's, no. Esp- Espinino. Oh, man. I can't say it today. Uh, Espinino. Wow, some days I can say words, some days I can't. It's a dyslexic thing. Things get tongue-tied in my mind, and things don't fire on a direct pathway. Daniel Espino, there we go. I had to say his first name to unlock it. You know, he was hurt last year. We don't care. We're not trading a pitcher that close with that stuff. Well, we're going to go talk with the Cubs. You sure you're not going to trade a pitcher? No, go talk to the Cubs. We're going to hold our ground like we always hold our ground and never come off these deals. We still prefer your package, but, you know, we could get this done right now if you include Bybee. No, we're not trading him. Fine. And the deal gets done. Like, that's what it feels like it's going on. That is my, uh, that is my being Frost, Scott Frost, right? Isn't he the, or is he a football coach? David Frost, right? That's, that's the Oakland one. He's not the failed uh, football coach. Uh, You know, that's how this is going. It's a lot of like, we're going to check with this. We're going to check back. We're going to come back. You know, we really like this guy. That's nice. Cleveland never budges. And by the way, the fact that like there is complete radio silence outside of, you know, fine sand throwing up things where he is. I mean, I, I don't know who he's friends in the Oakland system. It's like radio silence is a good sign for Cleveland. This organization, it's like the Braves and the Guardians are always radio silence. Like every Braves trade gets broken by the Braves Twitter. Like, no one else breaks it except for the Braves' personal account. That's the way it works. The Guardians, the, something might filter out a little ahead of time, but they p- play their cards so tightly. You know, The fact that there is nothing is actually a good sign. So don't get impatient. I don't expect anything too big tomorrow. I could end up being very likely very wrong. Maybe they decide, hey, we got this, and a deal can be figured out. But... Uh, you know, with your basic, if it is one of those guys they like a player to be named later and you hope that, uh, you know, if you're Oakland, it's like, okay, maybe it's Enright, it's who they like the most. And if he doesn't get through, okay, we still like Miziotic or something like that. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. I, I do think, again, I think, take a deep breath. I know we have this whole feeling of the last few years of this team not doing anything. I think something's going to get done. And, I think they feel good about their outfield. I don't think it's there. I think they feel good about their infield. Catching is the position there's a need. And I feel like, you know, there is one guy who is an elite framer with elite pop times. uh, And that guy is Nick Forte. I'm kidding. Well, he does have them as well. But Sean Murphy is in a class of his own defensively. When you look at adding uh, Mabry's, Valora, what does he have? He has amazing pop times. You know, he's kind of like Jorge Alfaro, essentially. 
um, some similarities in that profile so that they know that these rule changes are going to affect base stealing and they want to run it. That's why Kirk doesn't make any sense. It's why they're going to be looking for guys who can pop and throw and can frame, and that's Sean Murphy. And that is an incredibly valuable. And he's a right-handed bat to bring balance to the lineup, and he's gotten better every year in the big leagues, which, you know, is a positive sign. It's not a sign he is due for regression. I want to thank you for listening, rating, and reviewing. Downloading daily, it all helps. Justin will hopefully be back from having the flu, and uh, we'll have some exciting news to talk about. Uh, Tomorrow, I believe, is the MLB Lotto Draft. I think that is on the 6th with the seventh being the Rule 5 draft. So we'll have draft fever the next two nights as well. But thank you all for listening. You can find me on Twitter at Jeff MLB Draft. And let's end it the way we always do. Go, go, Guardians, go.